Hello, everyone. This is Chris Ragnar here from Perth, and uh, it's my uh, great pleasure in uh, welcoming you all along with my uh, co-chair, James Law from Hong Kong, for the um, uh, third um, uh, WEO Journal Club webinar uh, today. Um, we have uh, Lars Abakan, uh, um, who is the president-elect of uh, uh, WEO in 2024, uh, who will be chairing this session. Uh, along with this, we'll have faculty Amol Bape from India, Ruina Bamani from uh, Malaysia, and we have uh, fellow Mark Medina from Philippines who will be presenting the Journal Club. So I'm going to be now handing you over to uh, Professor Lars Abakan, who will say a few words about the uh, paper and then introduce you uh, to the uh, next session. Thanks, Lars. Um, thank you, uh, Krish. And um, it's a pleasure for me to chair this uh, interesting session. I think this is really a, a very uh, valuable uh, initiative of the uh, of the uh, research committee of the W and one of the various activities we hope will uh, you know uh, expand on the endoscopy worldwide. And so uh, <clears throat> the the paper which will be discussed today is quite an interesting topic, I think, because it's about the dilation time. Uh, of uh, you know combined uh, sphincterotomy and uh, large caliber balloon dilation. Um, I think we all struggle a little bit with this, and there are a number of various ways to do it, and we don't really know what's best in terms of efficacy, in terms of bleeding, in terms of risk of pancreatitis. And I think this uh, study was a uh, quite uh, uh, substantial effort into highlighting some of those uh, aspects. So um, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Marco Medina from the Philippines, who has uh, extensively studied this uh, paper and will uh, discuss the topic as well as the paper itself. And then after that, we will have a, a panel discussion around uh, related topics. So please, Marco. So good evening, everyone. So I'm Marco Luciano Medina. Um, I'm originally from the Philippines and currently doing ERCP fellowship training here in University of Malaya uh, Medical Center in Malaysia. And I was tasked to do journal appraisal um, on an article. So for the outline of my talk, um, I'll be discussing first um, the management of um, CBD stones, um, comparing sphincterotomy with balloon uh, papillary balloon dilation, as well as the combination of sphincterotomy and balloon dilation. So the second part of my talk would be the critical appraisal of the article. So CBD stone is the most common cause of extrahepatic biliary obstruction, which may lead to cholangitis. And ERCP is considered the first line um, in the management of CBD stone and other pancreatobiliary disorders. Endoscopic sphincterotomy is considered the first line strategy for the removal of CBD stones. And um, currently, CBD stone is the only indication for papillary balloon dilation, wherein as an alternative to sphincterotomy, it transiently relaxes the biliary sphincter, facilitating um, removal of the stone without damaging the sphincter. And in 2003, uh, the concept of combining sphincterotomy with balloon dilation um, was introduced and up to, uh, up to now is considered a useful alternative um, in patients with the large CBD stones that are difficult to remove using standard methods. So um, balloon dilation um, has several advantages over sphincterotomy um, as it preserves the function of the sphincter of OD, um, preventing duodenal biliary reflux, which may cause um, bacterial inf um, contamination of the biliary tree leading to cholangitis and recurrent stone formation. It also avoids um, post-sphincterotomy bleeding in patients with coagulopathy, and it facilitates deep biliary access in patients with altered anatomy because in these patients, usually the ampulla um, is also displaced 
making it difficult to do the conventional sphincterotomy. However, there are other um, clinical contraindications to balloon dilation. Um, and these are acute pancreatitis, acute cholangitis, precut sphincterotomy, um, benign and malignant strictures, prior biliary surgery, except cholecystectomy, and large CBD stones. So the European and the American guidelines agree that um, papillary balloon dilation is also is only an alternative to sphincterotomy. And the uh, ESGE guidelines specifically um, states that um, papillary balloon dilation is only indicated in um, stones um, less than 8 millimeters, especially in the presence of coagulopathy and altered anatomy. And the reason for this is supported by several studies and RCTs wherein um, endoscopic, endoscopic sphincterotomy, um, where endoscopic sphincterotomy is um, compared uh, with doing um, endoscopic papillary balloon dilation. And results showed that both have similar efficacy in terms of stone removal. However, uh, endoscopic balloon dilation was found um, to require more mechanical lithotripsy as well as associated with higher incidence of post-ERCP pancreatitis as compared to doing ERCP, uh, as, as compared to doing um, sphincterotomy alone. So as an alternative to, so as an alternative to um, sphincterotomy, papillary balloon dil dilation can be done um, using an 8 millimeter balloon diameter um, irrespective of the CBD diameter. And the balloon is dilated for at least um, two minutes following um, waste, waste disappearance on fluoroscopy. Um, data on the duration of um, doing balloon dilation is conflicting. However, in this um, randomized control trial involving small and large CBD stone, it was found that um, one minute balloon dilation um, has worse at outcome as compared to five minute balloon dilation. In terms of it, um, shorter balloon dilation is associated more with failed balloon stone extraction and post ERCP pancreatitis, um, suggesting that longer balloon dilation is recommended over short balloon dilation in patients undergoing balloon dilation alone. So in here, um, so in here, um, endoscopic, um, so in here, as I mentioned earlier, the the concept of combine of doing balloon dilation after endoscopic sphincterotomy was introduced like twenty decades ago already. And um, in this study of randomized controlled trial um, involving small and large CBD stone, um, the authors compared um, doing endoscopic sphincterotomy alone versus the combination of doing endoscopic sphincterotomy with balloon dilation and uh, a result showed that endoscopic sphincterotomy and the combination of endoscopic sphincterotomy with balloon dilation has similar efficacy in terms of complete stone removal and has similar rates of post ERCP pancreatitis. However, it was found that um, with endoscopic sphincterotomy, it is, it is associated with more use of mechanical lithotripsy as compared to combining endoscopic sphincterotomy and balloon dilation. This is in contrary to previous studies wherein um, doing balloon dilation uh, was found to be associated with higher rates of post-ERCP pancreatitis. So in here, probably doing sphincterotomy prior to balloon dilation would make the ampulla more loose prior to um, extraction of the stone, um, requiring less um, stretching um, prior, um, prior to the stone extraction, during the stone extraction itself. So in the recent years, um, another technique and concept was introduced wherein um, the use of large papillary balloon dilation in the management of large CBD stone. And in this retrospective study involving large CBD stones, um, the 
combination of sphincterotomy with large balloon dilation was compared with um, doing sphincterotomy alone as well as doing large balloon dilation alone. So in this study, the overall success rate in terms of complete stone removal was the same across all groups. However, um, the success rate of stone removal during the first ERCP was found to be higher in the combination of sphincterotomy with large balloon dilation. The need for mechanical lithotripsy and the uh, incidence of post-ERCP pancreatitis is the same across all the groups. So here, the ESGE uh, came up with the guidelines uh, which uh, recommends that for small, um, non-complicated um, stones, still sphincterotomy is um, the first line of choice. However, for difficult stones or complicated stones um, defined as a stone size more than 1.5 cm, multiple stones, narrow distal baldac and angulated common baldac, then um, limited sphincterotomy and large balloon dilation is recommended. So limited sphincterotomy is defined as small or mid-sized sphincterotomy, uh, one-third to one-half of the distance to the papillary roof, while large balloon dilation um, is defined as using a balloon diameter ranging from 12 millimeter to 20 millimeter. For those patients with previous sphincterotomy, then uh, balloon dilation is recommended uh, without doing extension sphincterotomy because it was found that doing um, extension sphincterotomy in these cases would put the patient in higher risk of developing perforation and bleeding. So giving, uh, considering all these methods that I've just discussed, um, different institutions, different gastroenterologists would have different practices when it comes to the duration of balloon dilation. And as we all know, the duration of balloon dilation may have an effect um, in the uh, post-ERCP complications. So that's why I came up with these clinical questions of um, in patients undergoing endoscopic sphincterotomy with balloon dilation due to a large CBD stone measuring 10 millimeter, is longer duration balloon um, dilation time associated with higher risk of incidence of post-ERCP pancreatitis? So I, I searched through PubMed using these following mesh terms, um, endoscopic sphincterotomy, balloon dilation, and time. Um, I limited my search um, to randomized controlled trials only, and this resulted to 19 articles. So I reviewed all the abstract of the 19 articles, which mostly would um, compare endoscopic sphincterotomy versus the combination of sphincterotomy and balloon dilation. Only two studies look uh, into the comparing the different duration of um, balloon dilation. Um, the second um, article compared the 60 seconds and 30 seconds. However, um, the sample size is small. The first article um, compared five different balloon dilation times and have higher uh, sample size. So hence, I uh, decided to uh, do critical appraisal on the first article. So the article is entitled Optimal Dilation Time for Combined Small Endoscopic Sphincterotomy and Balloon Dilation for Common Baldock Stones, a multi-center single-blinded randomized controlled trial uh, by Wenbo Meng et al. This was published in Lancet in 2019. So this study was conducted in 15 tertiary centers in China. Uh, for the inclusion criteria, uh, Subjects, uh, uh, inclusion criteria include adult patients with native papilla and those patients with a common baldock stone less than uh, 1.5 centimeter in size. Exclusion criteria incl uh, include those patients uh, with coagulopathy, thrombocytopenia, those patients taking anticoagulant and antiplatelet, um, those patients with previous sphincterotomy and balloon dilation, as well as those who had previous gastric surgery. Um, Patients with a benign and malignant structure were also included from the study, as well as those patients with pre-existing conditions, um, such as the following. So among the 3,721 patients initially screened for the study, 2,003 were randomly assigned to the five different balloon dilation groups. That is the 0-second, 
the 30 seconds, the 60 seconds, the 180 seconds, and the 300 seconds um, group. Uh, a number of patients or subjects withdrew the consent after the procedure, um, while the remaining uh, patients uh, were included for the intention to treat analysis. So all endoscopies were experienced endoscopies having more than one ERCP procedures in their um, career. Routine antibiotics were not given. Um, all patients underwent just limited sphincterotomy followed by CRE balloon dilation using different sizes of um, balloon diameter. The criteria for choosing the balloon size was not specified in the study. So the balloon uh, was gradually inflated to, uh, for 15 seconds to enable full ex uh, expansion and was kept inflated for the recommended duration. So for the zero second dilation group, the balloon was deflated immediately when the waste disappeared. Subsequent stone removal was done using basket and stone retrieval balloons and me mechanical lithotripsy was done as needed. So for post-ERCP prophylaxis, so it was used at the discretion of the endoscopist by using um, pancreatic duct stent insertion. Um, the management of the intravenous fluids for the subjects were not mentioned on the study, and, and rectal NSAIDs were not administered in all of the patients and during that time when the study was conducted. There was no consensus set um, in China regarding the use of um, rectal NSAID as post-ERCP uh, for, uh, for post-ERCP prophylaxis, post-ERCP pancreatic, uh, pancreatitis prophylaxis. So for the primary endpoint, um, the authors uh, want to determine the frequency of post-ERCP pancreatitis. While for the secondary endpoints, the authors want to look for the, um, the, um, the rate of um, post-procedural complications like bleeding, cholangitis, cholecystitis and perforation, as well as the common bile duct stone clearance rate, the duration of the procedure, the length of hospital stay, the success rate of um, common bile duct clearance on first um, attempt, as well as the proportion of patients who would require mechanical lithotripsy, the x-ray exposure time, and the number of pancreatic duct cannulations. So for the baseline characteristics, so although the authors did not report for the p-values um, by eyeballing, it seems that um, uh, because usually we use the p-values to uh, objectively quantify if the difference between the groups are significant or not. But by eyeballing, it would uh, it seem that um, there's uh, that the groups have similar baseline characteristics. So in here, I will just emphasize that the mean diameter of the common bile duct is 12 millimeter uh, with an average stone size of 10 millimeter, ranging from um, 8 to 12 millimeters, wherein mostly are multiple stones. All of the patients and subjects had limited um, sphincterotomy, ranging from 3 to 5 millimeters. The authors also look at those patients who had difficult cannulations, those patients who had more than one unintended pancreatic duct cannulation, and um, they also look into those patients who needed pancreatic duct uh, stent placement, as well as those who needed mechanical lithotripsy. So for the stone clearance, all the groups achieve um, similar um, complete stone clearance rate of more than 90%. Well, for the development of post-ERCP complications, so for the post-ERCP pancreatitis, we see that um, there is higher number of um, post-ERCP complications seen in the 300 second group and the zero second group as compared to the 30 second, 60 seconds, and the 180 second group. The rate of um, post of other post ERCP complications like cholangitis, cholecystitis, perforation, and bleeding um, are the same for all the groups. So multivariate analysis showed 
that age of more than of less than 45 years old and female gender as well as guide wire placement in the pancreatic duct as well as more than five attempts of um, cannulation and prolonged dilation uh, prolonged dilation balloon dilation duration during um, papillary balloon dilation is um, associated with higher risk of developing post ERCP pancreatitis So post hoc analysis showed that using a small balloon less than 12 millimeters is associated with the development of post ERCP pancreatitis, especially in the group, in the zero second group, uh, wherein um, it was found that using smaller size balloon um, is associated with post ERCP pancreatitis. So this can be explained probably because of incomplete relaxation of the ampulla uh, um, prior to stone extraction in the zero second group as compared to um, the other um, balloon dilation groups. So for appraising directness, um, so um, this shows that the journal, um, that the, um, that the journal corresponds well, um, so that uh -huh. there's, um, so that the journal corresponds well with the PIO, that is the population um, intervention and outcome of our clinical question. We're in, in a clinical question. We, uh, we are after those patients who have a large CBD stone undergoing endoscopic sphincterotomy with balloon dilation, wherein we want to know whether longer balloon dilation time is associated with post ERCP pancreatitis. Well, for the journal, so it included both small, small and large stones and compared um, several balloon dilation times after sphincterotomy, wherein um, post-ERCP pancreati pancreatitis was the primary endpoint. So for appraising val validity, so were the patients randomized to treatment groups? So yes, patients were randomly assigned into one is to one is to one is to one ratio um, to the different balloon dilation groups. So was allocation concealed? So the answer is yes. Um, although it's not explicitly mentioned, using computer-generated randomization list uh, preserved the allocation sequence. So were baseline characteristics similar at the start of the trial? So as, as, as I briefly discussed, so the answer for this is yes. So doing, um, doing random is, um, doing, Randomize, randomization usually um, would lead to um, similar baseline characteristics among groups. However, sometimes there might be um, differences or inequalities which may be attributed to chance alone. So in this study, only the patients and the outcome assessors were blinded. Um, although the caregivers or the clinicians or the endoscopists in this case, um, although not blinding the caregivers, the clinicians or the endoscopists in this case uh, can lead to um, performance bias. There are just some study design just like this study wherein blinding the clinician um, is not possible. So were all the patients analyzed in the group, they were originally randomized. So uh, modified intention to treat analysis was done, um, including all randomly assigned patients and excluding those patients who withdrew consent after um, the procedure. And so was follow-up rate adequate? So adequacy of follow-up rate um, refers to minimization of drop, the number of dropouts um, in the study. So here I did um, sensitivity analysis by doing worst case and best case scenario. Um, the purpose of this is to determine whether the number of dropouts is large enough to affect the, out, the, the outcome or the treatment outcome. So as in any other study, usually we use placebo as the control. But in this study, since we don't have placebo, so I use the zero second as the control group. So first, we determine the number of um, bad outcomes, which in this case is post-ERCP pancreatitis for both groups. 
Next is we determine the number of drop, um, dropouts um, for each of the groups. So that's 18 and 26. So for the worst case scenario, for the treatment group, so we assume that all the dropouts develop worse, uh, develop post-RCP pancreatitis. And for the control group, we assume that all the dropouts did not develop post-RCP pancreatitis. Well, for the best case scenario, so for the treatment group, so we assume that all the dropouts did not develop post-RCP pancreatitis. Well, for the control group, so we assume that all the dropouts develop post-ERCP pancreatitis. So here we see that in the worst case scenario, uh, there, there is higher rate of post-ERCP pancreatitis in the 30-second group versus the zero-second group. So this would mean that in worst case scenario, um, by la um, balloon dilation of 30 seconds is harmful rather than beneficial. So for the best case scenario, um, we see that the rate of post-ERCP pancreatitis is lower in the treatment group, in the 30-second group, rather, as compared to that of zero-second group. So this would mean that um, balloon dilation um, of 30 seconds um, is beneficial um, in the best case scenario. So how do we interpret this? Um, since the worst case and the base case uh, and the best case scenario um, resulted in different conclusions, so we can say that the drop uh, the number of dropouts is large enough to affect the treatment outcome. So I did the same for the different groups, uh, wherein um, I found that. In the, in the different groups, significant number of dropouts were, uh, were, also, um, were also found. So for the next question, so were unbiased criteria used to determine exposure in all patients? So no. So balloon dilation, balloon duration time, and the length of sphincterotomy are objective parameters that can be quantified and controlled. However, the choice of balloon size was left at the discretion of the endoscopist and no specific criteria was set. So were unbiased criteria used to detect the outcome in all patients? So the answer here is yes. So the assessment of all outcomes was based on a predefined diagnostic criteria like for the diagnosis of pancreatitis, cholangitis, cholecystitis, bleeding, and others. So for the appraising the results, so remember for from our clinical question, uh, we want to look whether um, longer balloon duration time um, or longer balloon dilation time is associated with, with risk of developing post-RCP pancreatitis. And in here, we see that um, the 30-second group, the 60-second group, and the 180-second group somehow have similar uh, rates of post-RCP pancreatitis as compared to the 300 second group and the zero second group wherein more patients was found to develop post-ERCP pancreatitis in these two groups. So this slide may seem um, too busy, but uh, let us go through it one by one. So for us to determine how strong is the association uh, between groups, so I just uh, I computed for the several um, for the following parameters and I use the 300 sec um, since the 300 second group has the most number of um, post ERCP uh, pancreat pancreatitis rate, so I decided to, to um, compare all the uh, all the other groups to 300 second group um, to know how strong is the association um, between the groups. So for the relative risk, it's actually the actual risk. And a relative risk less than one uh, would mean that it is associated with um, lesser risk of developing post-ERCP pancreatitis. While a relative, relative risk reduction would mean um, how much um, the risk is reduced. While for the absolute risk reduction, it is the absolute risk difference between the two groups. And the number needed to treat 
is the number of patients that needed to be treated um, to uh, prevent um, bad outcome. And in this case, it's post-ERCP pancreatitis. So treatment effects, uh, which in this case is um, re the relative risk, is usually expressed in range in the form of confidence interval. So in so 95 confidence interval would mean that 95% of the time we are um, certain that the relative risk uh, would lie uh, within um, this re um, intervals. So in here, going to the results, we see uh, that, the, uh, that the risk of um, post-ERCP pancreatitis is lowest in the 30-second versus 300-second group, followed by the 60 versus 300-second group, followed by the 180 versus the 300 second group, uh, where it's found to be significantly different, um, statistically significant um, based on a confidence interval, since the confidence interval is less than one. So um, the zero second um, group uh, was also found to be, uh, to have ha a lesser risk of developing post-ERCP pancreatitis as compared to that, uh, to the 300 second group. However, it was not statistically significant. So I also did a separate comparison of um, the zero second group and the 30 second group to see how much or how, how much the effect in doing um, shorter balloon dilation time. So in here, uh, there's 12% um, who develop post-ERCP pancreatitis in the zero second group and 7% in the 30 second group. Um, giving us a relative risk of 1.63, wherein there's a 63% increased risk of developing post-ERCP pancreatitis in the zero second group as compared to that of the 30 second group. And this is, um, yeah, and this is confirmed with the 95 confidence interval, um, more than one indicating that there is significant indeed significant um, increase in risk for pancreatitis in the zero second group as compared to the 30 second group. So for the author's conclusion, so balloon dilation time of 30 seconds um, for combined endoscopic sphincterotomy and balloon dilation um, reduced the frequency of post-ERCP pancreatitis and was determined to be the optimum dilation time for the removal of um, common bile duct stones. However, for my conclusion, so successful stone clearance rate is the same across all groups, across all the uh, all dilation groups, and balloon dilation time of 30, 60, and 180 seconds is associated with lesser risk of post-ERCP pancreatitis as compared to that of 0 and 30 seconds in patients undergoing combined sphincterotomy and balloon dilation um, for small for the uh, uh, for CBD stones. Um, including small and large stones for that matter. So um, I think in patients with higher risk of um, developing um, post-ERCP pancreatitis, as, as, I, as identified in this study and identified in, in other studies as well, I think doing shorter balloon dilation time, 30, min 30 seconds for that matter, um, is reasonable um, since... Um, is this associated with lesser risk of developing post-ERCP pancreatitis as compared to do, doing it um, a longer balloon dilation time. So for my last slide, so I was just want to point out some strengths and weaknesses of the study. So for the strengths, so this study is a multi-center randomized control trial. Um, it is adequately powered with a large sample size and it compared uh, five different balloon dilation times. Well, for the weakness, so it, it included both small and large balloon um, diameters. And for the choice of um, the size of the CRE balloon diameter, it's left to the discretion of the endoscopies, which can also be con which can be considered a confounder um, in the treatment outcome. Um, also, um, after um, after doing sensitivity and analysis, I was able to file. Uh, uh, we're able to say that uh, there is high number of dropouts that may affect um, that's significant uh, and may affect the the 
the outcome of the study. So that's all and thank you everyone for your time. Um, well, thank you, Marco. Uh, I don't know what the, the discussants will say, but for me, this was an exquisite analysis of uh, the topic as well as this uh, paper. So now I'll leave it to um, the discussant, Dr. Bhavani and Dr. Bapaya, to uh, to explore further the uh, the results you've shown us. Please. It's a, so good afternoon from India here, and uh, I think it's a, it was an excellent uh, description and analysis of uh, the study by Marco, I think. And uh, Rumina, would you like to go first with some of the points? Otherwise, uh, maybe you can go ahead and then we can I can take, take up a few. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Marco. That was... Um, very enlightening, actually. Um, so the we chose this paper because there have been um, a lot of preceding uh, articles with regards to the adequate or optimal timing of balloon dilatation, which uh, will which may reduce the risk of post ARCP pancreatitis. But as you can see, the conclusion is rather con um. It's, it's not conclusive. Some papers reported a longer period of dilatation is can reduce the post-ERCP pancreatitis. Some papers reported the otherwise. So I, I feel that the strength of this study, as Marco has um, rightly pointed out, is the study is uh, RCT, involves multiple centers, well-planned study, uh, a good number of patients were enrolled, although the number of dropouts were a bit high. And they actually uh, compared five different time of uh, balloon dilatation. So I think the, the basis of this time was based on all the previous papers, the 0, seconds, 30, 60, 180, and 300, which has been reported in the past. Um, the limitations of this study, I would feel that... Um, the investigator and the statistician was not blinded. So they um, there could be some biasness due to that. And as Marco has clearly pointed out, the balloon size were left to the discretion of the endoscopies. And there were five balloon sizes that could have been chosen. And this is, this is definitely a confounding factor. Um, the size of the CBD maximum in all these patients is 15 millimeter and the stone size is, uh, the largest would be 12 millimeter. So um, I wouldn't say this is a very large CBD stone, but uh, it's, it's more than one cm. So I think this is a very common scenario that most of us face when we do ERCP. And this paper has shed some light to dispel that a long uh, a shorter duration is adequate enough to sort of reduce the post ERCP pancreatitis. And they've even given a range, a good range, 30 seconds, 60, and 180 seconds. Um, I'll let Dr. Amol speak and then maybe I'll come back to other comments. Okay. Uh, thanks, Uina. I think really nicely wrapped up. And uh, so, you know, as I said, an excellent, uh, the paper itself is very good and the study is very well designed uh, and Marco really described the strengths of the study and the weaknesses very well. Now, just to play a devil's advocate over here a little bit, you know, some of the points which I did feel a little bit, you know, different in some ways is that one of the thing was that the, they've also included patients with smaller stones and that is one of the, you know, I would not say, you know, it has really impacted the outcomes of the study, but that is itself, that, that I would say is a significant confounding factor because, you know, I, I don't understand too much of statistics, but as an endoscopist, as an ERCPist, I fail to understand the need for doing a balloon dilation for stones which are 
less than 10 millimeters, say seven, eight millimeter stones. So what is the purpose of doing a balloon dilation in the first place when you can, you know, probably get, get these stones out only with the sphincterotomy and probably, you know, we will have the other, you know, Dr. Lars as well as others to comment on this as well. So that is one of the factors which I do feel is a little bit the same. The other important point is that, you know, what we can see in the study is that at both the ends of the spectrum, which is zero seconds as well as 300 seconds, the incidence of post ERCP pancreatitis is quite high as compared to the mid range. So again, to throw a light and, you know, some hypothesis why this could be happening, I think it's quite easy for us to understand that, you know, if we, die, we use a 300 second dilation time, then probably that is the balloon is exerting too much of pressure on the pancreatic uh, orifice and that may lead to spasm as well as lead to post ERCP pancreatitis. That is one possibility. The surprising thing is the zero, the zero second, where probably they've used 15 seconds as the or the minimum 15 seconds where until the waste was the waste disappeared. And there they stopped the inflating the balloon and the balloon was immediately deflated. So was this some kind of a rebound spasm because of a sudden decompression, which led to this kind of a situation? So we still are not very sure as to the pathophysiology, why the pancreatitis was higher in this group. That is something which is probably a little bit, at least from my point of view, I find it a little bit difficult to understand why that would happen. Now, naturally speaking, I think the 30 and 60 seconds is probably the most commonest time frames that most ERCP you know, experts would use everywhere. I think most people do use that. Some people do use a little bit longer, but I think you know, when you are looking at dilating the sphincter, usually the 30 to 60, 60 seconds is more than adequate. But these were two of the points which I definitely wanted to make. There will be some other points as well. Maybe we'll get Dr. Lars also to comment on this question and you can yeah, go ahead with some discussion points as well. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Amol and uh, Rubina. I, um, yeah, I agree with uh, all your comments. For me, also the most surprising um, uh, finding was that uh, the zero as well as the 300 second uh, dilation was uh, was uh, were equally uh, harmful um and uh, i also uh, reacted to the the size of stones because like you say large caliber balloon dilation is what we usually reserve for uh, big stones and so uh, whether this was um, a sort of a real life scenario that they uh, were studying uh, i'm not exactly sure um and also uh, i think in the introduction of uh, the uh, paper they were like expecting like the opposite result which was uh, a little bit surprising to me and i was a little bit surprised that they did not comment on that or hypothesize why this might be because normally uh, that's uh, when when you find unexpected things compared to the literature you would uh, want to justify or explain why that would be. So, Marco, do you have any comments uh, to that? Um, I think um, regarding um, some papers that were done before, wherein authors would say that longer balloon dilation time is preferred over shorter balloon dilation time, yeah. I think they are referring to doing balloon dilation alone um, but um, in in this study, it was found that doing sphincterotomy uh, prior to balloon dilation wouldn't require that much long of a balloon dilation, probably because uh, sphincterotomy would um, loosen up the ampulla and would require less of stretching of the ampulla. As compared to doing uh, balloon dilation alone, then you really have to uh, stretch out the ampulla longer um to to facilitate the stone extraction 
that's how i understand um the points that they the, the points that they pointed out in the um uh in the introduction of the study Dr. Lars, I would like to chip in a bit. Um, I also found it very interesting uh, that both extreme of time duration were the uh, were the ones that caused the most number of um, post ERCP pancreatitis. Dr. Amol has uh, nicely explained the possible reason for the longer duration causing post ERCP pancreatitis. I feel that when uh, for the zero second. Uh, group, I feel that probably there was inadequate uh, stretching of the uh, pap papillary or uh, there was inadequate stretching, muscle stretching. Hence, you know, during the extraction of the, uh, of the stone, there could have been some additional trauma to the area that could have contributed to the post-ERCP pancreatitis. But you talk, you talk about stretching uh, and for balloon dilation only, I agree with you, but my thinking has been that if you do the the uh, moderate size uh, sphincterotomy, what you're doing with the balloon is to rip it open further, but in the direction where the cut has been done. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I've been thinking it. And if that's the case, then once that rupture happens, like when the waist goes away like that, uh, because that's what it looks like, you know, it suddenly goes off. At that point, for me, uh, additional um dilation duration doesn't really have too much uh, effect except possibly uh, as a um, uh, remedy to avoid bleeding but i like your interest. i think yeah i agree with the uh, you know your thoughts uh, Dr. Lars, because i think you know the basic difference in philosophy and we were exploring this uh, when we are writing up the wo guidelines uh, you know for ercp and i think We've been discussing this uh, about this with uh, Anthony as well. That there is a basically a difference between the philosophy when we are doing a small balloon versus a large balloon dilation. I think the small balloon was primarily practiced in the 1990s and early 2000s. I think Dr. Lars, you you may be familiar with that philosophy where they were using it as an alternative to an endoscopic sphincterotomy. Yeah. And where they found that the incidence of pancreatitis was, was uh, unreasonably and unacceptably high, it was even up to twenty percent or so, and that was you know given up long ago. The large balloon dilation, the philosophy is very different because we are, as as you rightly mentioned, it's extension of the sphincterotomy in the direction of the cut by doing a balloon dilation, so you don't need to cut so much. And as rightly said it probably reduces the incidence of bleeding and other issues along with that. So that, that is a basic inherent difference between these two thought processes. And there's a reason it is usually reserved for small, you know, larger stones, more than 10 millimeters. And it's very rarely required, in my opinion, for stones smaller than 10 millimeters. I think Krish wants to say something. Yeah, Krish. Thanks, Amol. There are a few questions which has uh, come up uh, for the uh, um, faculty. Can you um, um, click on the uh, Q&A? You can see um, there's a question about, you know, uh, there's a comment about the size of the stones and the size of sphincterotomy. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I think this this point Ravina just mentioned actually that uh, what Dr. Kamil here said that the size of the syntotomy was not large enough for the balloon in the zero second group. But that is, I think all these patients were randomized, so very unlikely that there would be a separate group which will have something like this. But at the same time, I would say that as Ravina mentioned that Manipulation using the extraction balloon or the basket in a situation where the sphincter is not completely opened up, that could probably lead to more pancreatitis in that group. And the other question is, you know, and that brings me, you know, which Marco mentioned that there were, the maximum number of dropouts were in the zero second group. So Marco, do you think that could be an a factor which could be impacting 
you know this uh, you know the higher incidence or something of that sort you know i i, I don't understand numbers so well so i leave the statistics to you <laughs> Oh, uh, one of the interesting things I found uh, is randomization. And it yeah. says that uh, after deep cannulation, randomization done, how are the patients um, dropping out after that? Patients would have been already sedated. So where does the dropout come? I can't understand because if you have sedated the patient and done the ERCP and you got the uh, deep cannulation, the CBD, and then you're randomizing them, how can the withdraw concern there? I can't understand that, and how the dropout comes. Uh, Marco, can you uh, can you explain us how uh, what you read in the paper about that? Yes, uh, hi, Doctor Chris. So the authors did that specifically mentioned on the reasons of the subjects on the on on the dropout, but what they said is that um, these patients withdrew uh, from the study. After the procedure, so it can be like a day after, um. So, but it not necessarily during the time of the procedure. So, uh, what was mentioned was um these patients withdrew consent um to per, uh, to proceed with the study after the procedure. Okay, so that means uh, that is why they said modified intention treat treat is it because they um it is not per protocol. Um, yes. And you know, I don't know what that would have contaminated here, uh, the data, because it's quite a big sort of a dropout coming there, and we don't yeah. know the and and why so many patients dropped out. Is there anyone in that group who have pancreatitis and things? We don't know. I agree, yeah. and that was it was a very surprising thing because at that point, what's the point of dropping out? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I agree, it was a high number, and even more surprisingly high given. The uh, this uh, you know sequence of events. They should have reported per protocol analysis as well. Possibly. Uh, yeah. So, Krishna, uh, just one point about the you know the saying. Uh, there was a, only a single intervention actually in these patients, which was the balloon dilation, and that was the randomization which was doing which was being happened been done about. So what is the purpose of the patients dropping out after the procedure? You know, because there's hardly any post-procedure follow-up or something of that sort in these patients. And this is not a prolonged, you know, multiple, you know, sessions kind of a study, which, you know, multiple visits and things like that, which have been followed up. So what is the purpose of dropping out and not wanting to share the data? I really can't figure out out why Marco, you know, which you know the description which Marco gave, it really feels very surprising why that is happening. The other possibility which you raised was that whether these patients were consented for the study before they were sedated, but then the randomization happened at a separate frame of time after the deep cannulation was achieved. So the patient may have been consented for the study beforehand. Um, what I read is that obviously patients should have consented before uh, being sedated. Uh, they can't consent after being sedated. Obviously. So that has yeah. happened after deep cannulation. You are not going to do deep cannulation without sedation patient and consenting the patient. And after that, they have been randomized. How can they drop out if they are sedated? <laughs> well, they didn't drop out at that point. They just dropped out afterwards, which means that they were not allowed to use their data. Isn't that the case? I think so. Yeah, it was just... <laughs> There is an interesting comment about uh, that uh, maybe a rapid balloon troll could be traumatic uh, and uh, that causing pancreatitis. And I think it's a valid comment because you might think that the um, the size of the orifice compared to the size of the balloon or the size of the stone might uh, impact or uh, the uh, the traumatization of uh, stone extraction, which might impact again the uh, the risk of pancreatitis. So, and that wasn't really described too well, was it? No. That raises a point. They have not mentioned about the size of the balloon that was used in the zero second. Is it possible that you know the zero second? group of patients received smaller balloon dilations. It's just a hypothesis. And that is the reason there was more trauma, because that, that's the one thought process thought that came to my mind. But then there, there's no, no information on that in the paper. So. 
Yeah. yeah, exactly. So the the endoscopists were given the liberty to choose five different sizes of the balloon. So which ranged from six to eight, eight to ten, ten to twelve, ten to fifteen, and fifteen to eighteen. So it could be any one of those, and we do not know. And that is a real confounding factor. James, do you have any comments to any of this? Yeah, I agree with uh, uh, the comments that um, if I were one of the reviewers, I would have asked for intention to treat analysis, um, including all the patients that were randomized. And that gives uh, a much better uh, picture of overall what happened. Uh, second point was uh, whether we can we could stipulate the size of the balloon. The teaching is we should only uh, di dilate the uh, balloon to the size of the bow duct. So uh, I guess that was the reason why uh, why not one single balloon was used. Um, the uh, from all literature on primary centroplasty, uh, we learn if you have a very small opening, the pancreatitis rate. Uh, goes up. Uh, that was the case in the multi-center study by Desario published in Gastroenterology. So I thought the zero time dilation was a result of uh, inadequate dilation that the the uh, the sphincter muscle remained intact and the, uh, the opening was uh, not sufficiently large and that stone extraction was traumatic. So I thought that might have been the reason. Um, but overall, I think uh, I think the this paper tells us uh, we should dilate. Uh, we should uh, see the uh, see the abolition of the wasting once it, uh, that's it is done. That usually uh, takes place between thirty seconds to a minute. Then we should probably stop. But I think we should uh, stretch the balloon and allow the balloon to remain stretched for a little while to consolidate the opening a little bit. So um, that's uh, all my comments. Okay. Well, it's uh, very close to one o'clock. Uh, Chris, do you want to close off this excellent session? Um, yeah, thanks, Lars. I think it, uh, it, it has raised quite a few uh, discussions around this topic, which is, and I can see that it is it is not put to bed yet <laughs> based uh, on this particular uh, um, study. And uh, the literature review, what Marco did uh, was excellent. Um, uh, he did a quite an extensive literature review. And, uh, you know, so someone looking at it still, I'm not too sure uh, whether um, uh, it is the end of the whole thing. Um, again, um, it might need a different study to uh, answer the question um, about the amount of uh, time you need to uh, um, keep it inflated or probably the amount of... Uh, uh, spring trot we need to do um, to uh, uh, be successful and also uh, reduce the pancreatitis. Um, there are a few flaws in the study which we identified and uh, the pros and cons um, and the limitations are so well, uh, I think, read out. And uh, I think that's a, a good um, um, discussion what we had. Um, so at this juncture, um, if there is no other questions, we haven't seen any more questions, and if the uh, panel don't have uh, any more uh, comments to make, then we are almost on time. Um, I'll um, I'll take the opportunity to um, thank uh, the uh, all the uh, faculty um, and the uh, participants and uh, um, uh, Lars for uh, uh, sharing the session, and thank you all for this. And we'll be uh, uh, looking forward to see you in end of 2024. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.